Today we've got two Taylors, two Thompson Tees, and a lot of influence. What's up everyone? Special guest today, um, my very own close, personal, deep friend, Taylor Lagasse, uh, the design strategist and partner from our new venture, um, Kinship. So Kinship is a new influencer marketing agency that CTC has partnered with three amazing dudes to launch. Um, the joke about the double Thompson T is one, he's a Thompson T influencer if you haven't heard. Um, but he's Billy a, Thompson, shout out CEO. Billy Thompson, yeah. But uh, Taylor is with us to talk influencers and in particular the unique way in which we at CTC um, handle influencers. So Taylor, first, welcome, man. It's good to have you. Why don't you give us a little bit of the rundown on Kinship and what you guys are up to? I have to offer one correction. Instead of being the design strategist. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm the, the digital strategist. Digital strategist, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have it's the pleasure. They throw me. They make you think you're a designer because they're so fashionable. That's true. Yeah. It's a man of many talents. Oh. So Not Kinship, really. give us the lowdown. Yeah, so influencer paid media funnels is something that we get to run with uh, Taylor Holiday and CTC. Um, and we just kind of want to address a couple taboos, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, influencers being a little hesitant to engage in these sort of partnerships, whether they think they're getting rid of their social security number when they give us advertiser access or whatever it may be. We just kind of want to so, do a little myth busters here. Yeah, so a little myth busters around paid. So let's take a step back for anybody um, who doesn't know about the way that CTC in particular um, works with kinship on influencer funnels as you describe them. Can you describe what that is and how it differs from say just the traditional pay for organic post model? Um, describe how we engage with them and what the difference is between maybe how people traditionally work with influencers. Yeah, so an organic post is obviously the influencer going ahead and posting something on their feed. This is not something that would live on your feed. This would be a sponsored ad, if you will, just with your name um, in the ad itself with the content that we partner up and produce on behalf of a brand. Yep. Um, so that would kind of be the difference there. In addition to that, the paid media funnels would include other audiences outside of just your own, which is where definitely the mutually beneficial relationship exists within brand and influencer. Exactly. So the traditional model that probably if you run a brand or have worked with influencers at all is you pay Kylie Jenner $500,000 and she puts up an Instagram post for you and you wait around and hope that it works. And if it does, it's over in a flash because the algorithmic feed sort of lasts about 24 to 48 hours. You get your spike and that's about it. We have worked really hard to figure out how we look at and leverage influencers more as content creators than as distribution models. So a lot of people think of the audience that an influencer has as what's valuable. They have 500,000 followers, I'm paying to access those followers. But what we have found in working together is that the price that people pay for the distribution is often very overrated, uh, meaning that the actual CPM that they're paying to reach that people is more expensive than what you would pay on the advertising side. So we actually think of the distribution as sort of the commodity and that the content creator, their value is really their ability to be a salesperson mm -hmm. and communicate um, and influence people to buy their product through great content creation. Exactly right, exactly right. In addition to that, um, going off what Taylor Holiday just said, just the lookalike audience as well as their own audience within these paid media funnels and getting advertiser access, that's where that symbiotic relationship really exists right. and where the influencer can benefit. The, another concern and taboo that I always hear from influencers, literally every time I ask, like, do you want to do an advertiser access uh, deal in partnership with this brand? It makes sense. There's a high affinity between the two of you. They're always wondering, are you just going to continue to retarget my audience over and over yep. again and overwhelm these people, put a negative taste in their mouth, yep. and they're going to want to ultimately follow me? Honestly, quite the opposite, and it's hard to convey this to them at times because obviously on my end, <laughs> it's somewhat of a biased opinion, yep. but I'm just pleading with them because... Man, we have the opportunity of a lifetime just to grow your social value. Yep. We wouldn't come and do a partnership with you in the first place if it didn't make sense with this brand. If yeah. there was an overlap of audiences here where we want to take your name into their audience. And again, the most interesting one is the lookalike audience. Right. Um, where Facebook has the ability to do a, an audience built off your own, all unique followers, a group of 2.1 million people. Yep. And so in that following, in that audience, we're able to take your name with Taylor Holiday's money. <laughs> He gives me so much. Um, and just put that content in your name in front of this audience that is all unique to your following. Um, 
and are most inclined to go follow you yeah. and be a part of your community. So there's two points there that I want to sort of hit on that you, that you talked about that I think are really important. One is this idea that influencers are worried about oversaturation of their audience. Well, it's really important to understand that it's not in our, the agencies, the brands, or the user's interest to oversaturate someone to the point that they're bothered. And we actually work really closely to ensure that the ads we're sending are being responded to positively. In other words, they're translating into sales. And so we're never gonna be pounding ads into an audience that isn't leading to outcomes. So that idea is sort of a myth that definitely needs to be busted is that nobody has the interest of bothering people. So if we see any signals that, and also Facebook works really hard to protect users' feeds because it's not actually in their interest for people to have bad experiences on Facebook or Instagram. So the idea that people are being bothered by ads just doesn't happen. It's just not true because the data would signal it and we would respond to it in a way that would pull back the ads. The second thing you described is the ability to create lookalike audiences and share the influencer with new audiences, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times influencers think, oh, if I give you advertiser access, you're only gonna be advertising to my audience. And the secret is, what we're really saying is, hey, we don't actually care about your audience that much. It's not the most valuable thing to us. We actually think we know better audiences mm -hmm. through things like lookalikes or even our existing customers or people with attributes that purchase the product, that we wanna take you, the influencer, and put you in front of new people, yeah. right? And that's really the, ad, the, the value of advertiser access, is that we wanna run your page, sponsored posts, sponsored ads through your page to wholly new audiences, leveraging conversion-based objectives to access new people, which brings you and expands your brand in front of new people with our dollars, um, or the brand's dollars, so you're getting broader reach beyond your audience, and you're helping to move product in a way that's super valuable to both you and the brand. Yeah, exactly right. Not only will these people that these ads are getting served to be able to click on the ad itself and the content being produced here by the brand and the influencer and go into a shopping cart and yep. adding product, but they'll be able to click on your name, go to your page, and add to your social growth. Exactly. And this is people, once again, like this brand and this influencer are obviously coming together for a reason with overlapping audiences where this influencer you're gonna get put in front of audiences that have high affinity with yes. theirs, so it's adding to the density and maintaining the density of your following with the right kind of people. You're and not people getting- People purchase product. Yeah, people right. that purchase product, one, and people that are in line with your brand as an influencer. Yep. So it's like Laserway is a perfect example. Yep. Um, using Kimberlea Morris, they wanted to go after someone that had beauty, um, that um, hair and makeup, Things of that nature, and that's what Laserway also embodies, people mm -hmm. that take care of themselves and um, all about beauty here. And so within these audiences that have such a, a high affinity and overlapping audience, it's only going to add to her social growth and maintain that density of the people that follow her. Exactly. So because we're running conversion objectives, we're going out and pulling in people who buy product into your following. And so if I'm an influencer, I would actually be very excited for you to advertise to new audiences. Now I understand that if you're only gonna advertise to my audience, that's less valuable to me. But if you're gonna tell me you're gonna go put me in front of new audiences, I would love for you to spend that money all day long because all you're doing is helping to build the awareness of the influencer. Yeah. And that's why we think there's really mutual, mutual beneficial, mutually, blah, 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 mutually beneficial relationships between brands, influencers, and paid media that people are underappreciating in terms of the opportunity. So TL, if somebody wanted to talk to you about running micro to macro paid funnels, about looking at influencers, where can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, so we're Kinship, um, Taylor Lagsay, digital strategist. You can reach out to us at kinship.co. And that's K-Y and, K -Y and ship. ship. Yeah, exactly right. And I would just say one last final note, don't shy away from using micro-influencers. The Kimberly and Morris example that I just brought up, her lookalike audience had $20,000 put behind that where it performed at a $17 CPL and they had a target $40 CPL. And yeah. that person has 60,000 followers. Right, because again, it's about who creates great content. Yeah. Think of that, when you think about influencers, worry less about their following and worry more about who is going to be authentic and sell your product well on camera. Because that's the, at the end of the day, that's what makes a great ad. Um, and we are seeing constantly that through these influencer funnels, through great content, we're generating CPAs, CPLs that are well below target on all other prospecting. So at the very least, you should be trying this as a separate funnel alongside all of your evergreen advertising. So, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll run right alongside your existing agency or anybody else on these specific funnels as a way to sort of build an additional prospecting channel for you using a different point of distribution, which gives you also freedom to relax some of the brand constraints of how you speak through your own channel. That influencers speak like them to their fans, to their audience, to people in an authentic, real fashion above people that love your product. So, TL, any last, any last thoughts? No, 
Not at all. I appreciate the time. Appreciate you having me on. I Let's drop in on the end of this, that Kimberley ad that Corey's mentioning, so you can see an example of what this looks like, and you can check it out from there. We're here at Laser Way. You probably can see this, is your, this is for your comparison. Really cool. Oh, yeah. Got it. And then I'm going to blend it in. So it's been a few minutes. I'm definitely feeling the numbing sensation, and uh, it's feeling kind of hot. I literally cannot feel my face right now. Sun kiss tomorrow, and then at some point tomorrow, day two, three, you'll start feeling the lizard skin. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so we'll start right here in the middle, okay. and then we'll see. Let me know how it feels. This is a low setting. And here we go. I don't feel a thing. It's kind of relaxing, even though you can feel it. I definitely feel more heat on the cheek than I did on my forehead. So now we're leaving this really cooling mask on my face for about a minute. So it is now 12.54. My face is a little pink, but nothing, nothing that bad. It feels really tight and it's a little hot, but it's nothing unbearable. So I did kind of explain to you that I have some problem areas, my chin being one of them from scarring from cystic acne. And then I have some scars that I want to monitor to see if the clear and brilliant laser will take care of them, especially after my next treatment, which is going to be focusing on scarring and more texture. But I was actually pretty surprised that I felt like I already seen some improvement. So we're going to continue monitoring those scars and see if they improve at all.